I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your host of Nova Science Now, where this season we're asking six big questions. On this episode, can we live forever? Some folks seem to be built to last. This guy's 91. Of 96. 97. 98. These people live long and healthy lives. So what's their secret? And where can I get some? The answer may lie in these guys. They're like 90-year-old people who look 45. And what if you could replace your broken down human organs as easily as you replace the muffler on your car? Researchers insist that day is coming, and sooner than you think. I absolutely see a day where there will be jars of kidneys, and jars of livers, and jars of lungs, whatever it is you need. Also, can I live forever? Just in case our human bodies can't live forever, this computer scientist is trying to design virtual replicas, avatars, that will. An avatar is an instance of yourself that's digital, that will never die. Inspired by Star Trek and Superman. You do not remember me. I'm your father. He thinks he can build digital copies of real people that will carry our thoughts, memories, and wisdom into the future. You mean me? All that and more on this episode of Nova Science Now. Funding for Nova Science Now is provided by... You know, we take it for granted that nothing lasts forever. And that's true of life itself. Every living thing will eventually break down and die. But does it have to be that way? Can we live forever? We begin our show with a man who seems to have done the impossible. He's completely stopped the natural decay and death that all of us expect. Not for himself but for his car. My name is Irvin Gordon. My car now has 2,741,000 miles on it. You heard him, more than 2.7 million miles. The Guinness Book of Records says it's the highest mileage automobile in the world. Every time the car goes on, I break my own record and, and, and make it harder for anybody else to catch up. And they'd have more than four decades of catching up to do. He drove his new Volvo off the lot 44 years ago. And he and his car have been going strong ever since. You don't have to be the fastest to drive a million miles. You gotta just hang in there the longest. So this is your baby, huh? This is my baby, don't touch that okay. car. <laughs> Watch your knees. It's hard to understand how a car can last so long looks so good and rides so well after all those miles. Irv's car has the same mileage as all of the Apollo moon landings combined. How many places on Earth and things to do take you three million miles to get there? Commuting, uh, 125 miles a day to and from work. 125 miles round trip? 35 years. Are you retired now? I'm retired. So what, retired, retired 12 what? years ago. I was a science teacher. Excellent. And most of the nearly three million miles have come from 44 years of crisscrossing the country. The odometer turns over every 100,000 miles. Do the math. It's turned over 27 times. It's on its 28th. So what does Irv do to get his car to live forever? Well, number one, regular maintenance. I just do the things that it says to do when it says to do them. Things like regular tune-ups and oil changes, Irv figures he's gone through 110 tires, 440 spark plugs, 788 oil filters, and 3,143 quarts of oil. Sound like there could be some lucrative endorsement deals? So they put you on the payroll, is it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm still waiting for my first box of oil filters. <laughs> <laughs> Tip number two. If something's broke, fix it. Replace the worn out parts. Old cars drop oil. How much do you just drip, drip out of the, this car? You can go underneath my car with a rag, you won't find any oil. Really? Absolutely. I don't see anything dripping. Bone dry. That's because over the years, 
Herb has placed his car into the hands of an elite few. This is my A team here. <laughs> Richie Vermont serviced the car from when it was brand new until he retired seven years ago. <laughs> He's replaced three clutches and countless brakes and mufflers. That sound like it popped. Herb's maintenance bills helped pay for the education of Richie's kids. I'll tell you, I sent my kid to college. <laughs> the engine has been rebuilt twice. First by Richie after 680,000 miles, and in 2009 by this man, Dwayne Matika. All right, what do we got here? He said it was in pretty good condition. Oil pump. There was nothing wrong with the oil pump, but I figured after two million miles, it's a good idea to put a new one in. <laughs> Another rule of thumb. <laughs> every every two million. Obviously, you've replaced pieces of this engine. All right. Does that allow it to count as the original car? even though you're replacing the parts yeah, that we're sure, out. Yeah, sure, uh -huh. yeah. Mm -hmm. Irv says it's not any different from a living organism. Like your body replaces parts. How many times have all those different cells replaced themselves completely from beginning to end? Does that make you not you? It's the same argument. And of course, Irv would know. Well, this is coming from a science teacher. And so Irv will keep on going. Who would expect how a car would change your life? When you look at pictures taken over the years, you see a man getting older as his car remains as new as the day he drove it off the lot more than four decades ago. It doesn't show any signs we're giving up, and uh, hopefully this second rebuild will outlast my ability to keep driving. <laughs> and that leaves me with one last question. Can I drive your car? Absolutely not. Nobody, <laughs> Nobody drives my car but me. Nobody. 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 If something in your car breaks or stops working, like your radiator, you can always just take it out and replace it. But what about us? If my body parts break down, like my heart, I might be able to get a transplant. But right now, even if I could find a replacement part, one, it's gonna be used. And two, my body might just reject it. The dream would be to replace my heart or whatever's broken with a brand new version in perfect working condition, but exactly like my original. People have been talking about this for years, but now, thanks to some brand new discoveries, the dream of custom-made, personalized body parts may soon become a reality. In the 2005 sci-fi thriller, The Island, people have found a way to live forever. They grow clones and harvest their organs. But real science may be on the verge of a less diabolical solution. This, for example, is no special effect. It's a lab-grown lung, no clone attached. I absolutely see a day where you'll walk into a manufacturing facility somewhere and there will be jars of kidneys and jars of livers and jars of lungs, whatever it is you need. Just as in the island, your body would accept the new organ because it would be yours, grown from your cells. And there would be no more waiting lists for organs. There would be no more rejection. We would enter a new era where we could build the you an identical, ideal replacement. But how do you make an organ without a body to build it in? We've been growing cells in the lab for decades, but they just sit around in flat layers or clumps. So how would you coax them to form a three-dimensional organ like a heart with chambers, valves, and blood vessels? Maybe it's the same way you go from this to this. See, an organ is not unlike a building. It's a collection of parts that has to come together and work together. Think of a cinder block as a cell. The problem is, a block or a cell alone is not enough. To construct a building, you need to begin with an internal framework or scaffold to define the parts and hold them together. 30 years ago, transplant surgeon Jay Vacanti and chemical engineer Robert Langer 
realized that to build an organ, cells also need a framework, a scaffold to guide their growth. The challenge was to engineer scaffold materials living tissue could grow on. So this is a material that we call bio-rubber. Bio-rubber, and you, you use the prefix bio because whatever is the material it will take to flesh or living cells. That's right. So why does the cell even care? Because a lot of things could be toxic to a cell. Uh, or, or the cell wouldn't like their surface and wouldn't be able to grow on it. Picky cells. Cells are picky, and some are more picky than others. <laughs> but sculpting a scaffold out of the right material is only a start. To turn one into a living body part, an ear, for example, it must then be seeded with cells. A few weeks in an incubator allows those cells to multiply, covering the scaffold. Then comes a rather strange test. This is really creepy. I mean, mice are creepy enough, and this one has no hair, and a human ear growing on its back. Yes. He doesn't seem to mind that he has an ear growing on his back. No, he knows he's here for a bigger purpose. But this is a very, very important step in the science because on the back of this animal, we're actually incubating and growing perfect cartilage in the shape of a human ear. And it's completely connected to the blood vessels so that it's just like a native ear in a normal circumstance. In the head of a person. That's correct. So when this finally gets implanted in a human, you don't expect rejection, as is so common with new body parts. Exactly, because we're going to start with the patient's own cells It'll make his own tissue, and therefore the body will accept it. Within a year, Vacanti and Langer expect to be implanting their ears directly on the heads of soldiers wounded in Iraq and Afghanistan. But these will not be the first recipients of lab-grown body parts. Already, patients of other doctors have received blood vessels, skin, muscles, even bladders built the same way. I think with enough research, most parts of the body will be replaceable. And I haven't come across very many body parts where somebody somewhere isn't working on trying to replace them. Which is certainly encouraging news for people who need more complex body parts, like 20-year-old Stacy. I was in the hospital, and that's when they came in and told me that I may need a new liver. But will she get one? Every day, nearly 20 Americans die waiting for donor organs. So this problem is an extraordinary problem. There are too few organs for the well over 100,000 Americans waiting. But if we are ever to make the complex organs most needed to save lives, like livers and hearts, the scaffold builders will have to overcome an obstacle, namely plumbing. In a building, it's pretty straightforward. Pipes carry fluid where it's needed just like blood vessels in the body. Except that in a major organ, like the heart. You need a blood vessel per cell because the heart works all day, every day. And I don't know if you've ever seen blood vessels really, but they look like a tree. And the challenge is not to build that big limb, but to build those little tiny branches that come off. But building these intricate branches might be unnecessary if we take advantage of a remarkable fact. Organs are not just made of cells. So if you wash the cells away, what's left? Well, what's left are these proteins on which the cells sit and they form the framework of the organ, the scaffold. These natural scaffolds hold an organ's shape down to the smallest detail, including every blood vessel. So could they be used to build a complex organ like a heart? Six years ago, no one could say, because no one had ever stripped a heart of its cells, leaving the scaffold intact. But Taylor's colleague, Harold Ott, thought he could find a way. He would use the blood vessels in a rat's heart to deliver a chemical that would dissolve its cells and nothing else. But which chemical? So the process of finding the right chemical was literally a try and error process, starting from A to Z on the chemical shelf. First, 
Ott tried enzymes, but they dissolved both the cells and the scaffold. Other chemicals caused the hearts to swell up. Finally, he tried a soap commonly found in shampoos. We saw the heart become translucent, and it was obvious to us all that something had happened that hadn't happened the months before. What we had is this thing that looked like a heart, but it looked like a ghost heart, if you will. Injections of dye showed the scaffold to be undamaged down to the smallest blood vessels. And we now know that this technique works with many organs, including human-sized ones. This is essentially the scaffold of a heart. Who knew a heart had a full skeleton? But it essentially has no cells, dead or alive. It's beautiful. You can see the blood vessels here, the chambers of the heart. You can see the valves. But could a bare scaffold once again become the framework of a living heart? Taylor soon discovered it was more than a matter of injecting cells. Just putting cells on a scaffold isn't enough. It's putting cells on a scaffold and giving them an electrical signal and giving them a mechanical blood pressure and then giving them oxygen. It's not just a heart in a jar. It's a heart in an artificial body. So it's simple in many ways, and it's unbelievably complicated. After eight days, the first lab-grown heart beat on its own. It really makes you go, what is life? The first time you see something beat that was dead, it's one of those yes moments in life. Since then, Ott has joined Massachusetts General Hospital and used the same method to build a pair of lungs. After coming back to life, one lung was successfully implanted in a rat. So if you can make a working, living lung, then it seems to me you can... Make Built literally any organ. Any, any organ. This novel approach has already made a difference in the real world. In Barcelona, Spain, this woman, Claudia Castillo, might be dead without it. Two years ago, tuberculosis devastated her windpipe, <coughs> making it difficult for her to breathe. But surgeon Paolo Macchiarini saw a solution. Give Claudia a new windpipe, which her body would never reject, because it would be made of her own cells, grown on a natural scaffold. And so, in June of 2008, Macchiarini and an international team of specialists removed a windpipe from a human cadaver, washed it clean, and reseeded it with living cells from Claudia's body. Four days later, the new windpipe was transplanted into Claudia. If you transplant an organ without tissue engineering, you need immunosuppression, you need close watching, and this was absolutely not the case for Claudia. She never had any sign of rejection. Indeed, four days after surgery, she was home. More than a year later, Claudia is living a normal life, free of the fear that she will reject her new body part. I feel like the transplant is not from the body of another person. It's mine. That sense of ownership might soon be crucial to organ recipients because their scaffolds might not come from a person at all. This is a pig kidney sliced in half, and it's the same size, same complexity as a human kidney. We could cover this with human cells and, in theory, build you a kidney. Human organs built on natural or artificial scaffolds? Made from a patient's own cells to avoid rejection? Available in unlimited supply? Most researchers believe it will be a reality within decades. And Taylor is even more optimistic. Kidney, liver, lung. We're not decades away from building something complicated. We're more like years away.